So I wish you good morning, and I thank you for joining this first gathering of the Dean's Lecture Series of 2022. If I haven't already spoken to you yet this year, Happy New Year, and now I can put that darn phrase to rest, and good second week of the term to you. Uh, today we have representatives of the Institute of Myanmar United who will be exploring the science and applied creativity to post-traumatic growth and well-being. Specifically joining us today are Jeremy Brewster, the president of the Institute of Myanmar United, which he manages to do in addition to serving as a middle school teacher in Connecticut, where he continues to shake up the system through his use of creativity in his teaching. Having earned his degrees from Buffalo State University and SUNY Oswego in education and multidisciplinary studies with concentrations in creativity and change leadership, cultural studies, and social emotional education. We also have joining us today uh, William Fogarty, who holds multiple bachelor's degrees from West uh, Virginia University in communications, multidisciplinary studies, Italian studies, psychology, and professional writing and editing. I'm thinking he's their version of Giuseppe Salamone, uh, with his MS degree in creativity and change leadership from Buffalo State University. He currently serves as the director of programming for the Institute of Myanmar United. As a creativity and thought leader associate at Moving Experience, an organization that designs and facil uh, facilitates workshops and trainings for Fortune 100 companies, investment funds, and um, other organizations. Um, where they design and facilitate workshops and, uh, and trainings uh, and collaboration and things of that sort. In addition to his being the founding of Sea Life Creativity, a startup creativity, well-being, and education organization. So welcome, gentlemen. Uh, the Zoom is yours. Well, thanks so much, Larry. We uh, I don't know that I've ever received such a glowing welcome, which is awesome, or an introduction. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about applied creativity and post-traumatic growth. Uh, my name is Jeremy, and this is my uh, very good friend and partner, Will. Um, and we are going to, we're going to get started. So we're going to start with uh, ourselves. Once again, my name is Jeremy, and I, I'm an artist. I've always been an artist, uh, first and foremost, in my life. And that is something that I've carried with me through all of my various positions. Um, for me, my art has evolved over the years, uh, specifically in the medium in which I work. And I've done, I've done just about everything. Most recently, my medium, however, is I think life and, and change itself. And um, I try to apply my artistic, my artistic self in those realms. Um, so, and again, this is Will, Will, go ahead. Yep, I'm Will Fogarty, um, William Fogarty. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Larry. I do want to clarify that the three, psychology, Italian, and professional <laughs> writing and editing, are minors under the major, so I do not have five majors, just two. Um, but um, yes, I have had various uh, and multiplicitous pursuits in academia, as well as being a multifaceted creative facilitator uh, creative expressionist, and uh, all around, I like to think of myself as a creative human being. So one of the biggest things we're going to talk about today is creative expression. Now, our definition of creative expression is based on Addison's, and we believe that creative expression is when one can take from within themselves a phenomena, a sensation, a perception, a thought, or an emotion, and put it outside. They take what was once inside and through a process of creative transformation, represent it as a material act or thing. Now, put simply, what we believe is that an artist is somebody who explores and expresses feelings that they have within themselves through an artwork, which are then felt by a viewer. And in a nutshell, that's what creative expression is. So now that we've kind of looked at what is creative expression, it's also important to ex uh, explore the why behind creative expression. And uh, for some of us, and for some times in our lives, we can just be creating to explore the well being benefits or the enjoyment benefits that accompany being a creative person expressing creativity. So as you can see here, there are a ton of positive well-being outcomes associated with engaging in various forms of creative medium, 
Um, I can let you read some of those for yourself. Today, we're really gonna be zooming in on visual arts and expressive writing. So visual arts, as you can see here, some of the positive benefits are reduction of trauma, depression, and trait anxiety symptoms. While through expressive writing, you can see the overall improvement of physical health, including reductions in physician's visits and better immune system functioning. So just by creating and creative self-expression, there can be really positive well-being aspects. Uh, as Will and I got older, we realized uh, and became aware of the fact that our endeavors and creative expression extended beyond um, the enjoyment that we received from doing so and, and the general well-being outcomes that we felt as a result of doing so. We realized that we engage in creative expressive acts as a means of coping. And as we got even older, we recognized that um, this phenomena is uh, in alignment with an idea called post-traumatic growth. Now, post-traumatic growth, according to Tedeschi and Calhoun, is the retrospective perceptions of positive psychological changes that take place following experiences of highly challenging life circumstances. Put simply, what this means is that there is the opportunity for one to become stronger in a variety of domains following a traumatic experience. Yep. So now that we've kind of given a qualitative introduction to both creative expression and post-traumatic growth, it's time to dive into the research and say, okay, what are the actual findings related to this domain of psychology? So first we're gonna zoom in on how PTG works. And that starts by looking at the traumatic event and more specifically the effects of the traumatic event. So, and even preceding that a little bit, we wanna look at how we navigate the world, which is that we have an assumptive world built of schemas and heuristics and other cognitive processes, which allows us to go about our daily life making assumptions and thinking that we know how the world works. When a trauma comes along, that can present a major challenge to the person's understanding of the world, especially related to assumptions regarding the benevolence, predictability, and controllability of the world. In other words, one's safety is challenged, as well as one's identity and sense of what will happen in the future. And highlighted at the bottom of the screen, is the understanding that such threats to the assumptive world, which we have created to navigate our daily lives, are accompanied by significant levels of psychological stress. So there's the impact of the trauma, and then there's also the impact of what the trauma does. And put simply, what trauma does is it shatters. It shatters our understanding of the world and in turn our perception of who we are. Now this occurs because who we are is intricately related to how we understand the outside world. So now that we're zooming in on what happens with the trauma, which is essentially that it shatters some ability of our cognitive and even our neural pathways to process how the world functions, we then see growth occurring, not as a result directly of the trauma, but the individual struggle with the new reality that they are faced in the aftermath of trauma. And it's to the degree to which people are able to cognitively rebuild and to take into account the changed reality of one's life after the trauma that makes people create new assumptive worlds which are more nuanced, more integrated, and ultimately more resistance to being shattered. These results are experienced as growth. So while we've kind of talked about the conceptual background and the theoretical background, we're also gonna look at a case study and zoom in on how this uh, actually applied in uh, my own life. So first we'll look at a life-changing trip that I took to France. And this was part of the assumptive world that I was operating under. Um, I went to Nice and I had a life-changing experience. I was not all that happy studying abroad in Europe at this time. 
Um, I was feeling lonely. I was feeling frustrated by the slower pace of life and how I couldn't be as productive. And ultimately, it was a trip to this city, taking a walk along this incredible promenade and getting to experience a slower, more integrated, more appreciative instance of life that ultimately changed my worldview. It changed my life. It allowed me to be more deliberate, to be to slow down and to um, appreciate friendships and relationships at a deeper level because I wasn't running around everywhere like crazy. What happened then was a traumatic event happened, not to me directly, but um, was an event that impacted me very deeply at a psychological level, which is that there was a terrorist attack on Nice, France, July 16th, 2016. And where I was at that time, I still remember, is I was walking around the streets of Amsterdam when I got a notification on my phone. And it was psychologically very distressing. And part of the reason that it was so distressing is that going back to what we just discussed, it really shattered some of the assumptive world and the world that I was currently navigating. So before the attack, I had kind of had this implicit assumption that the places I travel to are completely safe. I'm not in danger while traveling Europe and nothing tragic will happen to the places I love. On the night and in the aftermath of this attack, I had to grapple with a reality that contradicted my assumptive world and the accompanying psychological distress of grief, anger, fear, resentment, rage, and all these other psychological moment, uh, psychological variables that were challenging to deal with. What it ultimately led to with time and with processing of the event is a cognitive rebuilding. So what I'm highlighting here, well, first I wanna call attention to the right side of the screen, which is a beautiful memorial to the victims of the attack um, and, you know, kind of a, as a way of demonstrating both the reverence I hold for all the lives that were lost that day, but also, you know, I'm going through an event that isn't of that magnitude. Um, but nonetheless, I'll return back to the um, psychological variables and sort of looking at how this unfolded. Um, before you see how some of the words that I highlighted, the places I travel are completely safe. I am not in danger. Nothing tragic will happen. After this, I had a more resilient worldview that I was able to build over time, which is the places I travel to are relatively safe. I am most likely not in danger, but I might be. And tragic events happen anywhere, can happen anywhere. And it's good to appreciate good things while they last, which is um, ultimately leading to a more appreciative and positive worldview. Um, there we go. Thank you, Will. Um, so now the gold standard for measuring post-traumatic growth is the post-traumatic growth inventory. This inventory was created by Tedeschi and Calhoun in 1996, and it features five domains of growth or five domains in which post-traumatic growth uh, is said to occur. Now, specifically, those five domains are interpersonal relationships, the perception of new possibilities for one's life, personal strength, spirituality, and an appreciation for life. So the first domain, interpersonal relationships, arises from the realization that the support of other people is necessary and the, from the resulting sense of increased closeness in relationships. So in my example, um, I experienced a very close relationship with an English teacher who I shared the experience with, and also when I was in Europe processing over the phone with family and friends, I realized that I could rely on my social support system and not have to mourn by myself. The second domain in which post-traumatic growth is measured and said to occur is the perception of new possibilities for one's life. It is said that when the experience of trauma uh, when we experience trauma, it is possible that it can lead to new options previously not considered, including the discovery of a new life path. 
so again, some new possibilities that emerged with the cognitive rebuilding uh, was using creative expression to commemorate and memorialize important and challenging times in life, being inspired to return to Nice again in the future, and having a worldview that accounts for anything that can happen. Now, the third domain in which pers or I'm sorry, uh, post-traumatic growth is measured is in personal strength. And this springs from the traumatized person realizing that they are stronger than previously thought due to the survival of their ordeal. So part of this personal strength I experienced afterwards was the ability to integrate grief, anger, and loss into a beautiful form of creative expression, which again, I will show a little later. And I also had a determined resilience not to be um, off put or to have my travel plans um, or my life plans interrupted by fear of what might happen and that I had a new appreciation for the preciousness of the experiences that I was uh, able to undertake. The fourth domain in which um, post-traumatic growth is measured is spirituality. And this um, is in reference to an increased faith in higher power and thus a greater understanding of spirituality. So this is a good point to highlight how the PTGI works. Uh, individuals can score higher or lower in any of these domains, which is are all related to post-traumatic growth. Based off my experience, I think this would have probably been the lowest uh, domain if I were to take the PTGI to measure my post-traumatic growth. Um, this would probably be the lowest. Um, I did experience an increase in gratitude, which is a spiritual variable. Um, measured in other psychological studies. So I had increased gratitude for my time there as well as my safety while traveling. Then the fifth domain in which post-traumatic growth is measured and said to occur is an appreciation for life. Um, this, our growth in this domain manifests as a revision of life's priorities and a new appreciation for life's preciousness. So um, in my application and experience of post-traumatic growth, um, I was able to appreciate the positive memories I had of, me, of Nice and not being interrupted by a traumatic event of this proportion while I was there. Um, a new appreciation for the preciousness of life that you can be going about your everyday life and something like this can happen and to a place that I loved. Um, it was very startling, but I also did experience a deepening of appreciation and even appreciating the beauty that can come out of pain through creative expression. Thanks, Will. So in addition to researchers having identified the domains in which post-traumatic growth can occur and consequently be measured, they have also identified contributing factors to post-traumatic growth. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the challenge to core beliefs. Uh, in addition to that, other factors include rumination, disclosure, and sociocultural influences. Great. So the so, first factor as we, oh, I'm sorry, well, go ahead. No, I was just gonna, I was just gonna speed it up a little bit and just go that one since we've pretty- Yeah, much. that's fine. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. Next, we're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into factor two, rumination, which um, is one that we as human beings can exert the most voluntary control over to some extent. Um, rumination here is defined as re-examining of the traumatic event and related issues as a means of processing. So in the PTG literature, rumination is broken into two categories and two subcategories. The first is intrusive rumination, and the second is deliberate rumination. And these can be measured soon after the event, as well as recently um, or more recently in time, or in other words, farther away from the event happening. So intrusive rumination is unwanted thinking that happens without the person wanting it and is likely to be distressing. Intrusive rumination is likely for most trauma survivors soon after the event. So again, looking at the time dimension, um, soon after intrusive rumination or unwanted thinking um, is likely to occur. And part of this is related to the neuroscience of intrusive rumination. 
So experiencing a traumatic event essentially leads to a stamping in of the vivid sensory images of the event, which then get fused together with the corresponding emotions at the level of the amygdala. So the amygdala is part of the brainstem or the reptilian brain. It is precognitive and um, therefore memory fragments that are stored at the level of the amygdala can persist for months, years, or even decades, intruding periodically into awareness without being integrated into conscious declarative memory. So um, again, this is the type of rumination that is harder for individuals to deal with, mostly because it disrupts their life with unwanted sensory images of the traumatic event as it happened. And this is another important finding is that even less direct exposure to the event as through vivid descriptions or eyewitness accounts can evoke similar responses. So that's the way that you can kind of get, have this traumatic experience without having to witness it um, directly. The next is a little bit more hopeful, which is we're going to zoom in on deliberate rumination, which is intentional re-examining of the traumatic event and related issues as a means of processing. It can include reflecting on events, trying to understand them, reminiscing, and trying to find solutions to life problems. And it can also involve thinking about positive, uh, possible, possible positive repercussions. So now that we've kind of defined these variables, um, we can zoom in a little bit on the relationship that occurs um, between po post-traumatic growth and rumination, which is that PTG is theorized to occur for individuals who move away from intrusive rumination and enter into more deliberate ruminative processes as time since the event increases. So in other words, we, the hope is that by entering into more deliberate ruminative processing and Beyond hope, uh, there's evidence that shows that moving into more deliberative ruminative processing as time increases since the event can lead to higher experiences of post-traumatic growth, which again is the ability to come back stronger from a experience of trauma. Some more rumination findings, and again, all the sources are at the top of the page here, and this slide deck can be sent out to anyone who would like after the fact. Um, some other findings are that deliberate rumination is significantly and positively associated with post-traumatic growth. So as one goes up, the other one goes up. Um, more deliberate rumination related to more post-traumatic growth. And PTG was also shown to result through deliberative ruminative thinking soon after the bereavement. So this is actually part of the reason that we decided to do a case study on representing this is that I engaged in deliberate rumination the night that I found out about the niece attack. So here is a poem, which is a representation of my desire to deliberately ruminate, process, express the event. And of course I use creative expression which is one of the key variables uh, that we'll be showing in the next section um, to do so. More findings are that intrusive rumination soon after the event was positively related to PTG, most likely because it indicates that uh, core beliefs have been shaken, but recent deliberate rumination most strongly predicted the current levels of PTG. So again, just emphasizing um, recent deliberate rumination most strongly predicted the current levels of PTG in the samples. Um, so this is um, a poem I wrote again, I started it the night that it, the attack occurred. And then for months, and I would even say a year or two afterwards, I worked on developing this poem. And it was a form of deliberate rumination for me that I could keep returning to and processing the grief of what happened to this place that I love. So um, as you can see, if you wanted to do a textual analysis, I probably could, but we don't have time for that. But there's, I think there's some evidence of a more nuanced worldview in these themes and the way the poem is conveyed uh, in the second, at the second time. And then finally, kind of concluding the um, rumination findings is that distress can be associated with recent intrusive rumination, uh, thinking directly, and intrusive rumination soon after the 
uh, bereavement. So that's kind of a positive correlation of two negative variables, intrusive rumination being positively correlated with, um, uh, with distress. So Thanks, next, Jeremy. yeah, we'll pass it to Jeremy. Um, so the, the third factor that is said to contribute to post-traumatic growth is disclosure. And very simply, disclosure refers to the discussing of the negative and positive consequences of one's trauma and self-disclosure about one's reactions to the highly stressful event. Now, the last factor that is has been identified as contributing to post-traumatic growth is sociocultural influences. And basically, this uh, references the degree to which themes of growth are culturally available to the individual. So um, as a result of this literature and this final finding, which we'll share with you that Tedeschi and Calhoun are kind of, who are kind of the preeminent post-traumatic growth scholars have suggested that this organically takes place in up to 50% of people. So up to 50% of people who experience a traumatic event can experience or may experience PTG. That leads to important questions for us as applied researchers and practitioners of creativity which is how can we get more people to experience post-traumatic growth and how can we get people who already experience post-traumatic growth to experience higher levels? So this is a nice segue into our programming session um, now that we've done quite a pretty extensive uh, background on uh, the theoretical underpinnings and how post-traumatic growth works. And um, actually concluding with kind of this hypothesis that's born out of these research questions, which is that facilitating self-guided intentional rumination through tools with modes of creative expression positively correlated with health and well-being benefits, going back to that well-being slide, correlating um, artistic expression with positive well-being benefits, that will then in turn improve the opportunity for PTG to occur more frequently, so in a greater percentage of people, and increase the levels of post-traumatic growth reported by participants. And now we'll get into some case studies of our programming. Right, so to be perfectly honest, this is the exciting part for me. I, uh, as a teacher, as a artist of sorts, I, I think that to be able to take these understandings and to apply them, to, to apply them beyond myself is incredibly exciting, fulfilling, and, and fascinating. Uh, I first had the opportunity to do so in Myanmar. Myanmar, for those of you that don't know, is also known as Burma, and it is a beautiful country located in Southeast Asia. It has a population of roughly 54 million people, 88% of whom identify as Buddhists. Now, according to the Burmese Iridati news magazine, years of internal conflict in Burma have produced a traumatized society with a hidden and unpublicized mental health epidemic. Compounding the problem is the dearth of clinics. There are literally fewer than 10 clinical psychologists and slightly over 200 psychiatrists available for a country with roughly 54 million people. Likewise, the counseling culture does does not um, counteract the fear of stigmatization that precludes many from getting support. As many of you know, very, very recently, there was a coup that happened in Myanmar in which the military overthrew the government, the elected government once again. And so this, um, this, this issue has only exacerbated since. Now, prior to this, in 2017, I had the opportunity to go to Myanmar as part of the uh, Myanmar Service Learning and Civic Engagement Course out of Buffalo State. And there I found myself working in a monastery school or observing in a monastery school. A monastery is a school that is run by monks. Um, and immediately one of the things that I noticed was the lack of expression. And there are various reasons for this. Um, what I ended up doing was talking to a man named Ujo Du, who is a very, very famous movie star and philanthropist in Myanmar about what it is that I saw. And through doing so, he suggested or requested that I develop a program in which I teach people how to express their emotions using art. And so what I did is I came back and I spent a year developing what I then called taking flight a course in creative expression. 
Now, Taking Flight is a four-part program that I delivered in Myanmar over the course of a week. Um, in part one, students are introduced to an art movement known as Expressionism, which arose out of Germany in the early 20th century. This artistic style, which developed in response to the rise of photography, is characterized by a desire to depict the subjective emotions that an object or event arouses within the artist rather than the object or event itself. Part two shifts away from that. And we do a very deep dive into emotions, specifically the five universal emotions as described by Dr. Paul Ekman, who did this uh, study of this project in association with the Dalai Lama. Now these emotions, which are anger, sadness, disgust, fear, and enjoyment, as well as their various triggers, states, and responses, are thoroughly studied in order to contribute in the development of overall emotional intelligence. In part three of this program, I uh, share with individuals the elements of art. Now, there are many elements of art. I focus on um, four of them. And I work with students. I teach students how to utilize these artistic elements, those being line, shape, color, and texture, in a way that allows them to express various emotions. In part five, four of this project, uh, students apply all of these understandings to create an artistic masterpiece. Now, the goal of this masterpiece is to capture a personal experience of emotional significance in the style of expressionism. Following that, there's a culminating celebration of art and self in which students have the opportunity to share their artwork with one another if they so choose to do so. And here you have the picture uh, from that celebration of art and self. Um, if we move on to the next slide, I have a few examples of some of the work that was done. Now, these two young girls were fantastic. The woman on the left created this piece. And uh, afterwards, as we discussed her work, what it is that she said was that in her culture, she has been suppressed and imprisoned uh, as a result of the military dictatorships and as a result of being a woman. And this image, this piece represents or expresses her feelings. Uh, and as you can tell, her feelings are incredibly strong. Um, and what's fascinating to me is the fact that in this, in this picture, she's smiling. And it is so seemingly contradictory to the image that she created. But in a minute, I'll share with you, I, I believe, why it is that she's, she's able to smile or why she's smiling so brightly in this image. Now, this woman on the right uh, produced a similar piece or a piece that represents something similar. And, and, and this piece really is representative of her struggle to fit in. So on the left, you can see that there are very tightly aligned puzzle pieces, which seem to fade into um, chaos or disaster or catastrophe as we move to the right of the image. She too shared afterwards that she struggles to find a place within this culture as a woman and as a young person who has experienced um, a military dictatorship that is incredibly strong and suppressive. Now, this next slide is, is powerful. This is one of my favorite students. He um, produced this piece. And after doing so, he wrote uh, what it is that I have uh, outlined on the right here. And essentially what he said through this is that in coming here, we all have given him the strength to show his his expression as he refers to it. He said, before I came to this program, I wouldn't show my feelings and I just kept my feelings in my mind. He mentioned that we all give him the strength or had given him the strength and the way to express. And two, here you see his smile. And that's that's one of the strongest pieces that I found um, is, is the genuine happiness and relief and feelings of joy which he has represented here. Literally, he said that those colors on the top of this image represent the joy that I feel in expressing my emotions. And it is, it's a powerful thing. Um, so I taught that in Myanmar and since I have revised it based on the feedback that I received, 
and moving forward um, with some of the ad additional applications that I'm hoping to carry out is to apply this in general classrooms. I'm hoping to also apply this within specific support groups as part of recovery programs at facilitative events or retreats. And additionally, I'm hoping to replicate this program using different creative modes of expression. So here we've really focused on visual art. I believe that this same program can be delivered using musical expression. I believe that it can be used, uh, can be delivered using creative dance or creative movement expression, writing and, and various other uh, things. Thanks, Jeremy. So um, I'm gonna share a little bit about a tool that I developed um, in interest of time and wanted to give you all the opportunity to ask questions at the end, I'm going to zoom through it a little bit. Just know that this tool is derived from creative problem solving. Um, it draws on two types of thinking, divergent thinking, which is defined as a broad search for many diverse and novel alternatives, and convergent thinking, a focused and affirmative evaluation of alternatives, which are separated in order to generate no novelty and keep it alive in thinking and acting um, and making it more efficient. Here are some guidelines. Um, won't have time to get into those today, but just know that in addition to separating divergent and convergent thinking, you are also asked to follow these guidelines um, in order to help you do so, to help structure your thinking and to make it safe to engage in these types of thinking. And there are also specific divergent and convergent thinking tools. So brainstorming is a popular and well-known divergent thinking tool meant to generate many options. And there's a convergent thinking tool called intuitive highlighting by which you use your intuitive gut feelings to select the most promising ideas. So you're generating and you're selecting. I used those foundations um, to design a facilitative tool called Freeing Writing, a facilitative health and well being tool, as my master's project. So, Jeremy and I both used our master's projects as forms of therapeutic, not therapy, but therapeutic creative expression with positive mental health and well being outcomes. Um, my tool in particular combines intrinsic motivation creative problem solving, thinking tools and guidelines, as well as the health and well-being well -being benefits of freeing writing in order to empower others through self-knowledge and discovery. Um, so again, highlighting that expressive writing is related to positive well-being outcomes and health outcomes. Here are the three elements of freeing writing. I'm gonna go rather quickly through them because I think it's more important to see how it's applied um, than to know how it, what it is per se. But essentially, um, and anyone who wants to try this on their own afterwards, if they want the slides to try the tool, they will be able to do so using these prompts. Um, basically, you're generating um, personally meaningful prompts or questions that inspire you to write, that are things you want to explore, that draw on your intrinsic motivation. And once you've generated these lists, you then choose one that you're gonna write on today. So here's how that would be facilitated. And then you free write, you set a timer and you free write. We offer some guidelines here in order to help you do so. The only rule for free writing mm -hmm. is to keep your hand moving the entire time. So whether you're stuck on one word and your mind's just repeating it over and over, you just keep writing whether you're experiencing fearful emotions or something coming up that's scary, you just keep writing. And in doing so, again, you get to experience those positive health and well-being benefits mentioned before. And the last element of this um, freeing writing tool is reflection. And you might think of this as deliberate rumination from the post-traumatic growth review that we did. And the, the user, again, gets to use their intrinsic motivation to experience whichever of these methodologies that they wish to do so. Um, again, here are some other additional applications. It can be a regular life practice, part of a facilitative event or retreat, or it could be incorporated into a curriculum like we are going to show next. Thanks, Will. So what I did as a, as a classroom teacher is I, um, I teach English uh, in sixth grade and I had to do a, a unit on personal narratives. And what I realized is that there is so much more potential 
than what the curriculum was asking me to do um, on its own. And so I, I took Will's tool and I converted it into um, what I call micro moments. And micro moments to me are memorializing transformative moments for health and well being. So, in short, what I, what I realized is that we can break down important or, tr or, or, or potentially transformative life experiences into a series of micro moments, right? I have an example here that I did, and this is my evolving perception of the end of life. Uh, my grandmother had passed away um, earlier last year, and I took this opportunity along with my students to, to explore that. And what I did is I broke down that two week process uh, into a series of important micro moments. Now to do so, I utilized some of the creative principles that Will had mentioned, um, divergent and converging thinking and brainstorming. And I came up with these, uh, what do we got here? Four, five crucial or transformative micro moments within that experience. Now, one of the biggest things that I realized is that there is a difference between summarizing and, and really storytelling, right? And so if we move into the next slide, I have an example here. Um, what I see with my kids is that they summarize, they summarize an event. And I think that cognitively that is how they um, make sense at, at that age of, of events that happen. And so I did something similar here as an example. Initially, I said, then my grandma told me that she loves me. That was one of my micro moments that I had identified within that experience. And through a process of freeing writing or free writing in which I utilized some of those principles and we also engaged in peer uh, feedback and a few other techniques, I was able to transform my summary of that micro moment into a story, as you can see here. Um, and this is one of my favorite pieces of writing that I've done. Grandma's shriveled face looked up as her eyes met mine. I felt a familiarness that I had not felt in many years. In that moment I was small again and she was both strong and sweet like a perfectly ripe strawberry. I love you, Jeremy, she said. And even still, you know, it, it gets me, right? And I'm, I'm not getting choked up because I'm, I'm hurt by it. I'm, I'm getting choked up because it was such a beautiful moment. And it took me to die into it deeply and to transform it from a summary and express it instead as a story, as a beautiful story, which is really what it was that allowed me to move through it and, and to develop this appreciation for that moment, right? Now, what's so beautiful though, is I was able to do this with my kids, right? And so here we have another example. And um, on the left, we have what she initially wrote. And this is her summary. She said, I held him. She wanted to discuss the passing of her cat, right? And this was one of the micro moments that she identified within that experience, I held him. And so she too went through this process that I helped to facilitate and she converted this summary into a story. And you can see here, I'll read this because this is absolutely beautiful. I held him. The sunshine emerged from the window as I stroked his harsh hair. I thought to myself, I guess this is goodbye. I knew he could hear me. I felt Felt his rough tongue hit my hand. I smiled a warm smile, which quickly turned into a line as the helplessness I felt emerged. I love you always. And she read that. And it was the most beautiful thing, you know, like to have a sixth grader <clears throat> do this and read this and, and share this with us. It was just so beautiful. Now, afterwards, I had a chance to talk to her. Her name was Lydia. She's one of my favorite kids. And she said this when I asked her what it is that this did. And she said, you know what? It helped me make sense of what happened. And I still miss him, but I understand now. It shows the power I think that we have as educators to apply some of these understandings in a way that is not only more interesting and exciting and meaningful, but in a way that can really truly help students, right? What I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to better work this program. I was creating it day by day as I did it, right? And, and turn it into something that can be applied across the country in classrooms. I, I hope too that we can apply this in specific support groups and as part of recovery programs, at facilitative events and retreats, and then replicate this again using different modes of expression. 
Wow, thank you, Jeremy, for that powerful story and also the emotion. Um, you know, I'm personally moved sitting here and as a collaborator to see you um, expressing so powerfully these meaningful experiences, both in your own life and, the, and in the classroom is really an honor for me. Um, so we'll just kind of close with some theoretical explanations. I won't go too long into this. Um, because, you know, what a powerful note. Um, but essentially here we've kind of highlighted some of the key variables of our programs, which we believe are helping relate to the witnessing of PTG and positive well-being and health outcomes. Um, some of the highlights are reflection and examination of life events through creative expression, obviously seems to be related to intentional rumination. Um, as we can also tell by this beautiful quote, um, creative expression helped her to deliberately ruminate and make sense of the world around her, um, and specifically a traumatic event. So I think that's the main highlight to hit there. Our conclusion is that there's a strong theoretical qualitative and case study evidence that supports a significant relationship between PTG, health and well-being variables, in the applications of our applied creativity tools, taking flight, freeing writing, and micro moments. Here's a proposed model of how that works. Students' life, trauma, challenged assumptive belief, creative self-expression experiences through our tools or any tool related to creative self-expression, activating one or more PTG dimensions, which will lead to PTG being recorded, and finally, uh, a model for teacher training that maybe if we're able to teach teachers how to facilitate these for others in the classroom, that the PTG will be recorded both by the teachers themselves and by the um, uh, students that they're able to facilitate for. So um, in closing, what we hope to do next is measure what specific PTG health and well-being variables are in impacted by our tools and also explore the question, can training teachers to deliver our applied creativity tools um, in the classroom facilitate PTG purpose and well-being for teachers and facilitate PTG for their students? Um, we're not gonna have time for that final exercise um, because I want to be respectful of the last few minutes to take any questions. Uh, but thank you so much. It is truly a deep honor for us to be here and to share the uh, the work that we've been doing. Jeremy and, and William, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I see such use of these tools uh, for the classroom, particularly in Philadelphia, where last year that just ended, um, gun violence was an all-time high many of our our students go to school having been experienced trauma in various different ways uh, through covid we all have experienced trauma um can you share you, you gave some practical applications but how do we get that word out to folks uh, uh, how can we help um, share this information and uh, get it in, involved in this curriculum of teacher education? I think that the, the first thing is really understanding what is it that we're doing? Because again and again and again, Will and I are developing these, these things that are clearly having impact, right? And so one of the things that we need to do on our end initially is to really research what is it about these programs that is creating these these results we have theoretical ideas but we do not as of right now have the research to back it up um beyond that i think it is i mean me myself i'm i'm applying this every day in my classroom right in different ways and i'm seeing the results and I, i'm hoping that through doing so and through sharing the stories that it is that that we have that we can interest others at the very least in, in wanting to learn more and wanting to work together and and really working hard to rework the curriculums that that exist to be more inclusive of 
the potential that that I think that we have right through post traumatic growth through creative expression. Will, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I also think that there's something to be said about being able to incorporate this into our own lives. Um, I think that's a really key variable that Jeremy and I bring. And, you know, seeing Jeremy be moved to that point of emotion, because, you know, we have experienced the benefits of creativity and post-traumatic growth and deliberate rumination as a way to synthesize challenging life events. So, um, you know, as we want to be able to facilitate it for others, I think it's also important that we experience those health and well-being well-being benefits for ourselves. Um, so, you know, whether it's taking a few minutes to free write and just keep your hand moving the whole time, or if anyone would be interested in trying one of these tools or even making up your own tools, what, what forms of creative expression are you using? What sparks your joy in your life? And what are some applications of that that you can share with others? So I think it really comes down to, you know, what can we do at a personal level to integrate this and our understanding in a way that's non-theoretical, which will then translate to us being able to bring this authentically to our own classrooms, to whoever it is that we're talking about it and kind of spreading the word through our direct powerful experiences and the stories that we're able to create as a result of it. I have two questions. Uh, number one, um, in our own lives right now, our democracy is being threatened by fascism. I see an application of your work to have better understand what's going on and have some tools to deal with it. My second question deals with self-directed learning, also called unschooling which is a national movement. And one of the things that our Center for Translational Research is hopefully involved with is to bring research into the hands and access of the end user, which it is not. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, distributing your, your knowledge, I would think one way would be to write an essay applying what you're doing to what are these two areas, which are, well, especially the fascism overtaking our democracy is a real threat. Thank you. I, I you know, I think so too. I, and I agree. And I think that, as I had mentioned, one of the biggest things is, is simply taking the time to understand what, what's happening in life because life goes by so quickly and so much happens. I mean, how often did we just summarize, right? As opposed to really taking the time to understand and to process and to make sense of. And I think that in, in both of the examples that I shared, um, taking the time to creatively express those micro moments or those experiences allowed me to, to more wholesomely and fully understand, which in turn provided me with a new a new worldview, and I think a more mature, a more wholesome worldview. And I think that today, to, to your point, Dr. R, it was so much is happening so quickly. We just, I don't, when do we have the, the chance? When, when do we have the opportunity to, to make sense of it? Yeah, I think there's also something to be said about um, our tools being self-directed and self-guided. So, you know, if we were facilitating a tool about, you know, something that is provoking anxiety for you, you are completely empowered to choose that topic. So if it's, you know, the threat of fascism and you want to explore that through writing, generate, you can generate creative questions using divergent thinking. What might be all the ways of phrasing this that get at the heart of whether it's my fear, whether it's my anger, what is the motion I'm trying to express? And then allowing your own internal dialogue or your own internal processing of the event to lead you to expressing it in a way that, you know, is aligned with your goals, whether you want it to be persuasive, whether you want it to be expressive, whether you want it to be abstract or applied, you kind of have the ability to 
apply it how you want with the issues that are most important to you, whatever those issues might be. But specifically in the case of fascism, that would definitely be a possible application. Are there other questions or comments? I just wanted to say, hey, Larry, um, I thought that was a wonderful job. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how you, you talked about the kinds of research that you'd like to see done. And so maybe engaging in, in a few discussions with you about what that research might look like, how to pilot this and uh, create some of these, uh, take some of these tools that you are working on and see how we could flesh them out into uh, classrooms and working with teachers and there, there's just a lot of potential uh, and a lot of, um, I think, interesting activity that can be uh, followed up on uh, from your ideas. And I like your energy, both of you, so. I really appreciate that. I think that, you know, as a teacher myself, I see the possibilities. And, and two, I, I'm somebody who has never wholesomely agreed with you know, the, the curriculum as it stands, it, it, there's so much more that we can deliver. and There's so much more that we can accomplish in the classroom. And I think that for whatever reason, people are, are afraid to, to, or hesitant to take that step, right? But, but it is possible. And I've seen the results firsthand of what can be accomplished when we do take that step. You know, I think that the last thing that I want to say is regarding motivation. Um, and this kind of goes back to what you were saying, Dr. R. Everybody wants to feel good. Everybody wants to be okay, right? And so this is this, these tools, I think, and these, you know, what it is that we're just creative expression itself is a means by which people can get there and students can get there. And it's something that I think is 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 as necessary, at least in my life, as breathing, right? It's something that I've used again and again and again to feel good. I'm somebody who has, you know, gone through my fair share as everybody has. And, and, you know, in a lot of places, we don't have access to traditional therapy. And by no means am I calling these, these programs or, or these ideas therapy, but they are therapeutic, and that they allow us personally to navigate these experiences that we've had and come out stronger because of them. I have a comment. This is Joy. Um, I really appreciate how your work bridges research and practice, um, particularly in this area. I think the blending of those two is so very important. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you so much, Joy. Yeah, we, really, thank you. we appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Going once, twice, three times. <laughs> so, uh, so on behalf of the School of Education and behalf of Dean Hamrick and the attendees and those who will be watching the recording of this, which my classes will be doing, of course, um, <laughs> I want to thank you, Jeremy and William, for 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 sharing your your insights and your and your work with us today. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's That's truly so nice to meet everybody. And with that, Eric, you may close the recording.